It is said that the 3,000 or so gigants of Catalonia could visually tell the history of the region without words. So widely and truly do they represent the occupations, legends, symbols, and identity of the region's people. Festive symbols of the community, these monumental constructed figures are brought out to participate in celebrations through dances and processionals. One of the most important themes that create gigants, capgrossos, and other traditional objects is the studio of partners David Ventura and Neus Osta. Growing up with artisan fathers, both went to an art school in Barcelona. Ventura first studied jewelry and then puppetry, while Osta focused on ceramics. Later, from friends, they learned the basic elements of press-molded paper construction and founded a studio creating small figurines. These same techniques were also adaptable for the creation of the larger giant figures and big heads. So they gradually moved towards a concentration of this line of work. Ventura and Osta were lucky to begin their careers just after the death of the Spanish dictator Franco, who had placed numerous restrictions on local expressions of cultural activities. Up until that time, with prohibitions on the Catalan language, cultural traditions and the right to public assembly, the use of the gigants and capgrossos was dying out. Some villages brought back old traditions, pulling dusty festive figures and floats out of dark storage to be shown off and dance again. In other areas, village elders decided that the new construction, baptism, and regular use of gigants or capgrossos was just the thing to transmit the local legends, encourage public participation in civic events, and promote local identity. The public's tremendous surge of interest in traditional arts, actions, and performances provided Ventura and Osta with the ability to support themselves by means of this historic art form. They now work almost exclusively on commission from municipal governments, neighborhood associations, clubs, museums, churches, schools, and even individuals. When commissioning a new gigant or capgross, Ventura may work from his own sketches or from photos provided by the client. He will discuss several alternate images with them before beginning three-dimensional representations of the image. First at a reduced size and then a second one to a scale. He models a clay a sculpture built up if necessary on a substructure of wood metal armature and a screening, or a styrofoam. Once definitely approved by the client, the original clay sculpture is coated with liquefied plaster.
Depending on the size of the piece, a straw may be added for extra strength. And if the image is complex, more than one mold section may be required. In the form that we know them today, the Gigants and the Capgrossos were originally added as part of short religious plays to enliven the festival of the Eucharist, El Corpus. During medieval times, these plays were preceded by procession, which itself quickly became one of the most significant parts of the event. The church felt that parading with the festive figures representative of other celebrations and belief systems would be a way to please and involve as extensive a following as possible. However, if the clerics had hoped that the importance of those other figures would be reduced by linking them to analogous personages within Catholic liturgy in an attempt to win people away from their heretical beliefs, they were completely mistaken. The corpus procession instead served to preserve and maintain the splendor and diversity of pre-Christian religious expressions. The more secular figures quickly became the key to wide public participation. Those special days when the gigants and associated figures were brought out became occasions for outlaying peasants to dress up in festive attire and travel to town to take advantage of the holiday and the opportunity to view the creations of some of the best and most famous artists of the era. After the plaster shell has dried, it is separated from the clay original and laid out to dry. Increasing use of the gigants was tied to the expanding nationalism of the first Spanish Republic in 1873. Although the Republic lasted only two years before reverting to the monarchy, it inspired an interest in exploring, preserving, and intensifying customs that enhanced a feeling of local and regional identity. By the beginning of the 20th century, however, some of the gigants were lost. This was a result of the decreasing power of local religious authorities and by the politics of the Second Republic, in which glorification of kings and queens were not welcome. Later, during the Civil War, the gigants were seen as enemies of both sides of the conflict. Republicans remembered the religious origin of the figures, and Franco's victorious nationalist saw the gigants as a cultural expression of Catalanism that they wanted to destroy. After the end of the war, it was hard for citizens to recuperate from these cultural manipulations and degradations. It was not until after Franco's death that an almost electric renaissance of elements of traditional culture took place. Now Catalonia boasts around 3,000 gigants and over 15,000 capgrossos. They are supported, transported, and danced by 20 to 25,000 people maintaining continuous year-round activities. Cosas 
Three different layers of special paper are laid into the plaster mold sections. A thin layer goes in first in order to absorb details such as hair and facial expressions. The paper is first soaked in water and then dipped in a homemade liquid glue mixture. To ensure that the paper layers don't separate, glue is also brushed over the top of the surfaces. Thicker layers of paper are added to the inside for strength. The ultimate size of the head of the figure determines how many layers of paper will be added. Gigants need to be sturdier than small figurines, so require more layers of thick paper.
After the moisture has evaporated, the layer paper slips easily out of the plaster molds, and the separately molded parts are glued and then stapled together. After the seams have dried, the staples are removed and the edges are smoothed out. Small details that would not survive the grosser aspect of the mold, for example the horns of the devil, are added individually by hand, with seams covered by small strips of moistened glue covered paper.
A coat of homemade gesso creates a hard surface that will make the heads and figures less susceptible to damage in the course of the regular movement and use. They are painted with latex-based commercial product with a satin or eggshell surface. The larger, more elaborate pieces may be finished off with exterior varnish for greater protection. Cap Grossos have always had a role subordinate to the giants because of their size, the typically grotesque exaggeration of their features, and their playful aspect, all in contrast to the elegance and stateliness of the giants. There are so many more of them, in part because they are cheaper to produce, smaller, and with no need for elaborate costuming or wooden supports. By virtue of their size, the Cap Grossos are carried differently from the gigants. The big heads rest on top of the caveat's head, shoulders, upper back, and upper chest, and like helmet mask, require viewing through holes cut out in the head's nostrils or mouth. Typical figures include peasants, the fisherman and his wife, a pirate and the surprise victim that he robbed, and members of the prosperous middle class. Others may be satirical, but generally realistic personages found in daily life, such as girls and boys, the sun and the moon, but also the exotic, the exaggerated, or the grotesque can be seen, such as hunchbacks, clowns, jesters, witches, or devils. The repair of damaged figures follows the same lines as the creation of new ones, and is a significant component of Ventura and Osta's activities. Dancing at so many events, the gigants may become unbalanced and fall, breaking limbs, scratching paint, 
and denting body parts. Restorations match the original work as closely as possible. Ventura and Osta fill scratches and dents with putty and then cover the entire area in gesso. Finalizing it with latex paint toned with appropriate stains or grounds matched to the original colors. For the Gigants, the creation of the painted press molded paper figure is not the end of the extensive process. Ventura and Osta hired a local carpenter to build the large wooden substructure that supports each giant figure. Although the supports are constructed from lightweight wood, the figures are still awkward and heavy. So the support has four legs to allow the porter to easily set the figure down between dances or processions. Although the supports are constructed from lightweight wood, the figures are still awkward and heavy. So the support has four legs to allow the porter to easily set the figure down between dances or processions. A local seamstress sews elaborate costumes for the gigants according to Ventura's detailed sketches. The costuming is an extremely important part of defining the personality of the gigant in terms of its role and time period. It is also an expensive part. Around 25 feet of satin, silk, and velvet are typically needed to create the costume that will drape to the ground and hide the porter's body and legs. Accessories, nets, and needles for fishermen, crowns and scepters for kings and queens, hoes and shovels for peasants are added later. Hair may be painted on, or for special figures, maybe a costume made wig. Ventura also designs and fabricates the figure's jewelry and crowns as needed. Depending on the size of the figure, the complete fabrication can take between a couple of weeks for a cap gross or two months or more for an elaborate giant. For all of the complex technical and aesthetic effort that goes into the creation of the gigant and despite their imposing presence in an upright and stationary position, they are most impressive moving down the streets or dancing in a village plaza surrounded by their seemingly miniature humans. Although they reveal complex technical mastery of a variety of media, these secular icons do not completely come into their own until they are danced as part of a community event. In 1973, only 30 villages in all of Catalonia presented and danced their gigants in open-air gatherings. In remarkable contrast, by 2002, there were more than 350 such gatherings, a striking manifestation of the fever to recover and strengthen local traditions that engage almost every Catalan village after Franco's death. Gigants and Capgrossos are typically accompanied by the strident and reedy voice of the Grala. Initially a shepherd's pipe, its piercing sound has now been converted into an instrument of communication, calling the public to join the festivities. The musicians, often accompanied by drums and even bagpipes, may play traditional Catalan melodies as well as more recent valses, two-step or jota. The combined height and weight of the giant figure is such that it takes practice to hold them properly, let alone to dance them in a crowd. Balance and equilibrium are supremely important. A strong wind can be enough to cancel a giant's performance, for once a figure becomes unbalanced, it is almost impossible for the porter to prevent it from falling. Older gigants were much heavier than those constructed now sometimes up to 220 pounds each. Balancing these heavy figures was so taxing that the porters were said to have spelled each other every five yards. Although today most are volunteers, historically the carriers were paid small fees or given a new pair of shoes for the laborers. 
Gigants, Capgrossos, and other traditional press molded paper figures do not singularly represent a veritable chronicle of history, a purely folkloric construct or a reinvented tradition, but instead reflect aspects of all three. Morphing over the centuries from personifications of the Church's teachings to more secular figures identifying local or regional traditions and pride, their contemporary potency arises from the fervor of long-suppressed cultural expressions and the rebuilding of Catalan identity. The ability to trace the descent of this art form for at least the past five and a half centuries has provided sufficient justification for the fun adoption of gigants and other figures, whether older or brand new, as a community mascots. This provides a tremendous opportunity for the creative development of traditional imagery. David Ventura and Neus Osta are able to balance continuity of technique, imagery and usage with innovation in each of these areas, thus carving out an artistic niche that reveals authenticity of tradition without a stagnation. Although they have dedicated themselves to the creation of gigants and capgrossos since 1979, every day we learn new things says Ventura. The technique of constructing these figures isn't something you learn directly, it's something that you learn little by little as you work. <laughs>